it is uh, our uh, distinguished pleasure on behalf of uh, our department and also College of Engineering and University to welcome our distinguished speaker, Tom Thurston. I'm sure you have seen this uh, uh, file, so uh, he has a very uh, uh, eye-catching and uh, profound history in high end computing. So I would uh, just introduce by him by the part which I know uh, somehow, somehow. And he is he was a uh, naval <coughs> officer. I'm a petty officer in the USA, is that correct? And just like uh, uh, the few computer architects I knew in this country started with Tom, with uh, Berlin Space, who, are, who is the uh, <coughs> lead architect, Martin still alive, also shared the same history, went to US Navy, and went back to get a scholarship, went to MIT. And he, he received the her, her, her scholarship and join MIT, the place uh, where multi list and, uh, and many other concepts which are important now, like futures, uh, which is a, uh, a power of a computing concept and uh, many others were developed in early uh, 80s. With Tom and I overlapped uh, a few years at MIT. And he was not in the flow group, but he was uh, understanding, had a, perhaps had a deeper understanding on the impact of uh, some of the early execution model work at MIT in terms <coughs> for a, a span of history on high end computing for 30 years. In computer architecture, there are many ideas come and go very fast. There are hundreds of models are proposed. Few survive, unfortunately. And uh, so, as I look at the history of uh, high-end computing, Thomas Law is, uh, can, can use the word truly significant and historical. Because he, uh, very soon he, in the early 90s, he realized the problems of parallel computing architecture. There are many false uh, missteps or false starts, but one thing which is missing is something called execution model. I paused here. And, uh, and that has a fundamental concept of design computer systems. Only very recently, that observation started to have a profound impact in our field. Now, uh, I, let me mention only one uh, uh, thing which strikes me uh, <coughs> significantly uh, is in terms of the concept of cluster. So you know, all know clusters. Today is a day-to-day uh, -day concept in many places where uh, computing, when you need performance, you put a few, uh, uh, you order a clock. And uh, at the beginning, that is called the Bell Old Bellbo class. And Thomas are credited as the father of Bellbo class. And he won the prestigious Golden Bell Award in 1997 for his contribution of introduced the cluster computing architecture in the, in the, in the world. And uh, later on, he always joked that he regret that uh, his, uh, this has so much impact in day-to-day -day computing uh, on high in, in the high-end part of the high-end computing architecture uh, from the long run. So I would like him to come and I'm sure he will mention for this, I will leave the stage and let's welcome our speaker. Thank you, 
very much, Professor Gao, for that uh, uh, really very flattering introduction. Now I have to pause here because I have to get rid of this slide. Let's see. I'm, I'm a, 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 so I'm a new Mac user. <laughs> <laughs> now there are two, you can always call them a Mac user. Two problems. Uh, the first is absolutely incompetent in the use of the computer, which I'm demonstrating now. <laughs> and the second is that I'm an absolute zealot. And anyone who doesn't have a Mac is clearly uh, limited in extreme and unforgivable ways. <clears throat> Not an opinion I held just before I got a Mac. It is uh, truly a, a pleasure and honor to be here. It's been many years since I've spoken to this audience, um, and the uh, University of Delaware has a warm and close place in my heart, and has played a substantive uh, role in the research that has unfolded over the decades in which I have been able to uh, collaborate with the University of Delaware. Uh, very recently, some of you were involved, we had a meeting uh, I don't remember when last summer. Of course, I don't know when it is now. Um, I should pull out my thing that we euphemistically refer to as a phone, and, um, and it doesn't say the date. Uh, so I'm told it's April. Uh, we had a meeting that uh, discussed this challenge of execution models. The parallel, parallel execution model workshop was a second of such. And the result of that meeting, not held not far from here, the Department of Energy actually began a new, albeit small, program on modeling of execution models. That program is currently ongoing uh, at this time, involving three different national laboratories, by the way. Many years before that, and I'd be hard pressed to remember, sometime around 2000 or 1999, we held a meeting here at the University of Delaware, and it was involving the HTMT project, an exploratory project that investigated the premise of building supercomputers uh, out of uh, very extreme technologies. The first attempt to do a detailed architecture design of a petaflops scale machine. And uh, while there are now petaflops machines, uh, nothing has come close to the size, the physical size, yet that we determined was possible, or I might say the energy uh, needed to run them. Uh, and uh, uh, Professor Gao and I have worked on uh, multiple uh, other NSF uh, projects, including one on our joint invention of percolation, a means of managing, among other things, heterogeneous computing. So I'm, again, very pleased to be here, and I thank you for your gracious welcome. Let me start off just by posing uh, an application challenge to you, and uh, then we will come back to this challenge at the end of my presentation. At uh, the state of Washington and at uh, in the state of Louisiana, there is the largest National Science Foundation experiment uh, to date. This is LIGO, the Laser Interferometric Rational Observatory the largest attempt to measure uh, gravity waves. Indirect evidence uh, through astronomy has shown that indeed gravity waves exist, but we have yet to measure them uh, quantitatively. This uh, device, a classic interferometer at an extreme scale, is kilometers on, a, uh, on an edge. The reason there are two of them is so that we can use, this, we can use the signals between them. Only those which correlate uh, can be considered truly uh, uh, extraterrestrial in that nature. And uh, we can use them also to help uh, determine direction. While the legs are kilometers long, the actual measurements taken are fractions of the nucleus of an atom. This, uh, you can imagine the signal to noise, this is science at the most extreme. In order to extract a meaningful signal, it turns out, one has to already know what you're looking for. One has to know what the signal should look like, and that allows us to differentiate that from the plethora, the abundance of noise that is otherwise detected. And by the way, yes, they do use Beowulfs to uh, do the data processing on this. 
The way that's done is we do simulations of uh, known or expected cosmological phenomena. An example might be the collision of two neutron stars together as they go through a death spiral and eventually collide to produce a single a body of neutronium. And we do simulate this. That's a nice side effect, by the way, if we get the phenomena correctly. Uh, it's also a prime candidate for mon uh, modeling um, uh, gamma ray bursts, uh, one of the most energetic phenomena observed. How do we do that computing? Well, we do it by complex simulations uh, that themselves are very difficult. Difficult to write, difficult to run, difficult to scale. We'll come back to that issue of scaling uh, at the end of this presentation. Well, let's start at the top. This is K, not from the men in black. Um, the Japanese uh, beat us in many ways, certainly the scale of this machine, but uh, they also beat us and they actually have a word for 10 to the 16th. I wish I had a language that had a word for 10 to the 16th. Uh, uh, the K machine came online uh, less than a year ago and uh, is being upgraded to achieve on the order of 10 petaflops a sustained performance uh, on the um, HPL or LINPAC uh, benchmark. But it was only six months before that that another machine, also in Asia, was the number one machine. This is Tianha, or some appropriate pronunciation, forgive me, my Chinese colleagues, for that uh, butchering of it. But it was uh, two and a half, more than two and a half petaflop sustained performance, uh, a beautiful machine and a, a clear demonstration of the rapid advancement of technology growth in uh, the People's Republic of China uh, with this machine. They designed and built it themselves. Yes, they used Intel parts, and yes, they used NVIDIA boards, but everything else was theirs, including, very substantially, the network. The network, in fact, has a, a peak throughput in excess of twice that of InfiniBand, for example. Also, the third processor class that they used, this one for I.O., was built from the sand up. They designed and fabricated their own microprocessor, and we will see many more of such products uh, enter both the high-end computing and mainstream in the future. Yet, this is only scratching the surface. Problems such as the one I've just introduced are identified as exascale problems, problems that must run uh, 10 to 1,000 times faster than uh, these machines are capable of. And how we are going to get there is the story of my talk. It's the purpose to describe, because although in achieving a teraflops, this is a um, millionth of an exaflops in 1997, the ASCII Red machine, and achieving the first petaflops machine, this Roadrunner, um, in 1998, about 11 year part, the same formula was applied. And this was based on the killer micro integrated with DRAMs combined with some kind of a system area network using the communicating sequential processes model. In terms of programming, you know this most, um, most commonly as the message passing model as uh, manifest, for example, by the ubiquitous U uh, MPI uh, programming interface. That's a factor of a million from a gigaflops to a petaflops in a period of something just barely in excess of uh, 22 years, 25 years. Extraordinary advance. And a formula, a recipe that has proven so sustainable that we have an entire generation of professionals in high-end computing who've known nothing else. Dow mentioned the Beowulf class machines. They're one of the two general class of machines, the other being MPPs, that have used this formula quite successfully. The Beowulf machines, where appropriate, 
uh, have uh, dramatically improved the performance of cost and provided accessibility to an extraordinarily broad community, one that simply was uh, largely ignored in the earlier days before uh, these machines. On the other hand, I will say, and I mean this, that uh, the Beowulf class machines, while very good at uh, capacity class computing and not bad at what I call cooperative computing, the uh, weak scaling of MPI programs, is not a very good capability computer. I've always been amazed that they would, in many cases, replace uh, superior machines. Horst Simon gave a talk at uh, the International Supercomputing Conference a few years ago on his 20th anniversary. He gave the what he said was the top 10 ideas in the last 20 years in, in high performance computing. I was, I was initially honored, uh, but then thought better of it, uh, when he called Beowulf the fourth, fourth from the top of the, of the list. Uh, for to calibrate MPI was number two on that list. Uh, he said Beowulf would be higher on the list, however, if it hadn't done about as much damage as it has done good. And um, I had to point out to him earlier, uh, later, that, that he said he was measuring it based on impact. He hadn't said that uh, it had to be positive impact. Here's uh, one of the take-home messages. I got this from Burton Smith. Uh, Gao mentioned Burton earlier. Uh, it's a little outdated, but the numbers speak for themselves. The green line is Moore's Law, continuing exponential line, an unbelievable uh, observation on part of Gordon Moore. Uh, back in the late 60s, that there'd be this roughly um, uh, doubling increase in uh, uh, device density and DRAMs uh, in, in an 18 to 24 month period. The exact uh, definition varies uh, from time to time, but that, that seems to uh, b continue uh, even th probably through at least the end of this decade. It can't continue forever. There are only so many grains of sand in the universe, uh, but probably long before that happens, we will, we will um, uh, run into the atomic granularity. Nonetheless, for the purpose of this presentation, Moore's Law is alive and well. Not so the many other characteristics that we tend to use Moore's Law as a metaphor for. Uh, such as performance or speed. These uh, other curves you see, and now I have to squint because my eyes weren't, uh, aren't what they used to be, but um, uh, one of these is a uh, clock rate. And I'm going to guess, excuse me, now I really do have to look. Yep, that's the dark blue line there. Clock rate continued to improve over two decades uh, from the late 1970s when we were dealing with megahertz uh, until um, uh, the last decade as we crossed the gigahertz time frame, uh, t um, a clock rate. Uh, as you can see, due to power constraints, uh, we um, are flatlining on clock rate. In fact, we're in a period largely asymptotic, although there's a bit of a spread uh, anywhere from about half a gigahertz to maybe three and change in gigahertz across processors available. But those numbers haven't changed. Indeed, it's anticipated that overall average clock rate will not increase by more than about 30% through the end of this decade. This is very different from the Semiconductor Industry Association, SIA roadmap of a few years ago that imagined that by the end of this decade would be somewhere around 70 gigahertz or so forth. It isn't gonna happen. Um, I say that with regards to semiconductor. I wanna point out that if you were to run, if you were comfortable with temperatures around four Kelvins, and you were to run uh, RSFQ, a rapid single flux quantum technology, this is superconducting technology, you would already have a clock rate in excess of 700 gigahertz, uh, proven and reproduced in the, in the laboratory, uh, but not currently easily available from Intel. The other flatlining effect is equally worrisome because it touches on the other source of continued performance gain with Moore's Law over the last 20 years, and that was in the area of architecture. Architecture allowing us to exploit more and more forms of concurrency or lightweight parallelism, very lightweight parallelism, to allow us to do more things at once. And that continued to grow shallower, but still at an exponential rate until, well, frankly, we ran out of tricks. And so here we are. We can't increase the clock rates and we can't increase the concurrency. And by the way, 
That means we can't increase the performance on a poor per core basis. We can, however, use more cores. And in a talk I gave at another conference a few years ago, and the title has been quoted, uh, multi-core is the new Moore's law. Uh, not growing quite as quickly because there's another mitigating or modulating factor in, well, that's the market. There's um, uh, two different forms in which multi-core takes place, what we call multi-core sockets, and uh, the other is in GPUs. GPUs are really uh, very, very highly parallel, very uh, regular structures of uh, a form of, of uh, CPUs executing largely in a SPMD-like uh, form. However you organize them, it's bringing more and more cores to the problem. Now, it's not surprising that we find ourselves building systems for high performance computing that are changing their structure. This uh, chart is based on the top 500 list that was first started in 1993, about the same time, by the way, when I started the Beowulf project, uh, also about the same time that UC Berkeley uh, started the NOW Network of Workstations project. Uh, it's hard to believe, but there was a time when a workstation and a PC were two very different technologies. Those days are behind us. I think that's good. Um, I'd like to believe we get the power of the workstation for the price of the PC. It wasn't until, uh, in fact, 1997 that the first such cluster showed up on, on the uh, top 500 list, and that was indeed uh, a later version of the now uh, system um, uh, that started that. And, and you see it now, now in that large yellow swath. Those are commodity clusters. Below that, the blue, are the MPPs, the other killer microstructure. But at the beginning, towards the left-hand side, you see there were others. There were even single processors. There were SIMD machines. There were SMPs. All of these different structures were of sufficient capability that they provided, they provided uh, at least enough capacity to be on the, on the top 500 list. But this chart lies because that yellow swath that you see suggests that there's been this continuum of commodity clusters, of Beowulf or Linux clusters. Indeed, um, uh, without bragging, I will say that Linux is by far the most widely used operating system in high performance computing, uh, greatly exceeding 95% of all deployed machines in that category. And uh, I think our project was first in that at least we were running the first single applications across multiple nodes using, using Linux. That's a little bit different from pure throughput computing. So we find that we're going to now have more and more cores. How do we program them? How do we capture the idea? If we're in this period of transition, what are the new ideas that are going to guide us. So I, I, um, I'll tell you frankly, I'm not a religious person, but I did at this time go once to church for some inspiration. Now, this is a very special church. Um, this church is in Barcelona, and if you look carefully, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're done staring at me in the picture. If you look carefully and look down, that's not an altar you're seeing. Well, I think of it as an altar, but it's a 60 teraflop supercomputer. This is Mare Nostrum, one time the, most, the fastest machine in all of Europe uh, and currently being upgraded uh, and it's part of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And lest anyone be offended, I'm assured that the appropriate pixie dust, whatever it takes to make it legal to put a computer in a church, has been done. Um, so uh, it, it's all okay. But the reason I was there was not so much to see the computer, although I've got to tell you that's a really cool place to put a computer. Um, but rather, it's to look at the work that they have done there. Uh, Jose um, Labarda, uh, under Matteo Valero and others, have um, uh, been exploring the use of using uh, uh, DAGs, or uh, directed acyclic graph, for developing the precedent constraints of defining the conditions under which execution can take place. Well, there's nothing new to this. Professor Gao uh, and his uh, colleagues, um, uh, Jack Dennis and many others, have been working in similar uh, structures, although somewhat different in actual functionality of data flow graphs. This is an idea that is recurring. Indeed, this work alone has been uh, used for uh, the last um, 
uh, 10 years, and it, it's become uh, fairly effective. The particular modality for this model is to actually insert it within a conventional model, the MPI model. So it's a mixed model. Here uh, you see on the chart uh, several different ways of doing the LINPAC benchmark. Uh, the, the lower ones are OpenMP and MPI. The higher one in, in performance is uh, the um, is this system called STARS that uses this DAG. Others have used the DAG as well. Okay, so there, I didn't do these graphs, it's not my fault, but there's a little bit of duplicity here. Maybe some of you caught it. The um, bottom of the uh, vertical axis is not at zero. All right, this is only a slice of the, of the vertical distance here, so it isn't quite as dramatic as it suggests. But what has changed? What provides that performance and what is the likely chance of getting superior performance? Performance through increase of efficiency, performance through hopefully dramatic increase in scalability. If we can't increase, increase the speed of the processors, then we best increase the number of them that we're using and the use that we get out of them. And the answer is from a practical point of view, the development uh, and use of runtime systems. Software that guides the execution throughout the uh, run of the problem, uh, making best possible use uh, of the resources that are available, using information that's only available during the execution that's not available at compile time. Decisions that have to be made at runtime to take best advantage of the available resources. You know, it's sort of like the two pictures in this slide. Uh, the, the lower picture you see here is a, is a cannon, right? This is a uh, fire and forget kind of thing. You, um, you fill it up with a certain amount of gunpowder, you put the cannonball in, you aim it, you fire it, it goes bang, and the cannonball is often, it's on some trajectory influenced by winds, air, and, and all sorts of other things, running into birds, I suppose. As opposed to um, the, uh, the uh, guided missile above it, which is a closed system, is constantly measuring its trajectory and making changes in order to correct for any errors that are interjected, and so providing much higher, much higher accuracy. And we want to do that in computing. We want, to, we want to provide that constant adjustment to get the best usage, usage in time and usage in energy uh, from our, our execution. That uh, cannon, by the way, uh, it's uh, actually a really big cannon. I, I've seen it. It's, it's in... Um, uh, I was in the Kremlin in Moscow about a year ago, and uh, there it was, really gorgeous. I mean, that, the mouth of that cannon is enormous. It's about a meter in diameter. And the cannonballs, they're, they're even more impressive because, well, they're more than a meter in diameter. Yeah, okay, for the one person who was paying attention, those cannonballs would not fit in that cannon. Um, it's okay, they never actually fired it in anger. All right, so I'm describing a runtime system as a new, a new element of future high-performance computing systems, but what, in fact, does, uh, what guides the design, the development of that runtime system? How does that runtime system interact with the compiler? Or, for that matter, how does it relate to the programming model? Is there a new programming model? And in the other direction, how does it, in fact, support the architecture? How does it work with the operating system? All these questions have to be answered in some perspective, some strategy, and uh, this strategy is an execution model. Now, I, I'll, I'll be candid. It had never occurred to me that the notion of an execution model itself was a contentious issue. I assumed that everybody knew that you had implicitly or explicitly an execution model. I didn't even want to discuss that. I didn't anticipate that this would be a, well, let's call it a contribution for the sake of you being polite to me. Uh, I thought the specifics of the execution model were important, but not, not the general concept, the meta paradigm. Well, I think that we in fact are approaching a time do the reasons I've just said, that we have to change the way we do computing. We have to change the paradigm in order to achieve, well, and exploit the runtime systems, achieve the higher levels of efficiency greater than, say, 5%, and achieve the scalability, how about two orders of magnitude or more? We will need that if we're going to get to exascale. An execution model 
is an approach, a model that provides the governing principles, that guides the co-design of all of the layers simultaneously of a future system, and at the same time defines their interoperability during, during execution. It is not a horizontal or virtual machine. It does not hide everything below from everything above. It, rather, it is cross-cutting. It touches all the layers simultaneously and allows you to define all the layers with respect to itself, the execution model, which, as we were discussing earlier today, is an order n level of complexity, as opposed to trying to decide and define every layer with respect to every other layer, order n squared complexity. Well, why, why am I so confident about the fact that, that execution models are important and, and, in fact, that we're ready to have or need a new one, as well as what are its properties? Well, because we've done this before. This is not new. This is not, in fact, different from the history, uh, past history of computing. It's just we haven't done it in the last 20 years. Now, my history may vary somewhat from yours, but I can identify at least five phases of computing in which we have, driven by the changes of technology, vacuum tubes and transistors, small-scale and medium-scale integration, large-scale integration, very large-scale integration, and whatever we're calling the new era as we approach nanoscale technology. Certainly, we're all comfortable with the idea of vector processing, which was SSI and MSI. When LSI was available, we had another level of density that we could exploit, but vector processing didn't scale. Vector processing was then combined into multiple vector machines, what we call PVP. At the same time, the SIMD array model was also developed, and competing machines were produced, and they were all operating somewhere around uh, gigaflops. In about 1990, you choose your date, we started to move into the killer micro period. A hallmark machine would have been the Intel Touchstone Delta that in 1991, funded by a number of different federal agencies and installed at the Center for Advanced Computing Research at Caltech, uh, was at a, a 20 to 30 gigaflop sustained performance capability, depending on applications, the fastest uh, computer in the world at that time. And now we are almost 100,000 or yeah, about 100,000, five orders of magnitude further than that in, in a very short time frame. So if we have had execution models change in the past, execution models that responded to the opportunities and the challenges of enabling technologies as they so dramatically changed, and that these in turn changed our programming models, our architecture models, and our support system software. Why would we think that that is never going to happen again? Why would we insist on maintaining the old techniques for new technology when it is so abundantly clear that we are in a time of extreme peril in making best use of such systems? And that peril is not to be exaggerated. The efficiencies are single-digit efficiencies. The power consumption is now reaching unacceptable levels. K at about 10 megawatts. The threshold of, of uh, comfort, and comfort is a strained word in this instance, is about 20 to 25 megawatts, according to those in this country who have to pay for those machines. Remember, a megawatt over a year is about a million dollars. So over the lifetime of the machine, we are approaching the point where the power costs will exceed the actual deployment costs for such machines. Is it just about money? Well, it's about accessibility. It's about what resources we have that we can bring to our problems. Now, I referred to this ability of combining or co-designing different layers. It's really the decision chain that I'm talking about, the system making the decision as to where an operation occurs, when, to do what, with what arguments. That's what that directed acyclic graph contributed to, 
That's what the work that's been done here for so many years is about. And it's what the work that will determine the next execution model. That decision chain decides what each layer can contribute, leaving to the other layers uh, what, what they themselves have to provide as well. Each of these changes are in response to, I think, four underlying factors that contribute to the degradation of performance, degradation of efficiency, degradation of scalability in deriving performance. The four, I use the acronym SLOW, starvation, latency, overhead, and waiting, waiting for the resolution of contention. Starvation is simply the lack of sufficient work to do, sufficient parallelism, either because there just isn't enough work to do in the problem or because we put the work in the wrong places and the system is, has poor load balancing. Latency is the time distance for doing remote access and remote service calls. If that latency blocks an action at the source, then we lose cycles. Overhead, in my view, perhaps uh, uh, the most critical of these, not only uh, this is a critical work that you have to do, but it doesn't actually contribute to the it doesn't contribute to the to the actual work of the application. Rather, it simply contributes to managing the system that's doing the application. So it's, it's lost work, lost energy, and lost time. But more than that, it defines the lower bound on granularity that you can effectively use. And that, in turn, correlates with the amount of parallelism that's available. Hence, it's a contributor to starvation. And then, of course, there's the, uh, the issue of contention that has to be addressed. And it has to be done at runtime because except for very special cases of uh, uh, access patterns that one can work with at compile time on fixed topology and timed networks, we, um, we really have to adapt to the changing conditions. So how do we address these? Well, there are a number of concepts which over time we've come to understand if unified into a single execution model may provide us for much, if not all, of the required improvements to use the emerging technologies that are enabling what will ultimately be an exascale machine. And I would like to uh, touch on these briefly and then talk about an experimental execution model that um, is uh, uh, being used to explore uh, and investigate these, uh, these different concepts. And, and I'd like to highlight the fact that even as we think about new systems, we're also thinking about new applications. New classes of applications which have, until only have not until only recently received sufficient attention. And these fall under the term of uh, graph problems. You're actually very familiar with graph problems. Every time you uh, go, to, um, uh, go to Google or go onto Facebook, you're using very large graphs, social networks and so forth, search engines, relational databases. Those who do uh, STEM problems, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, will find a set of adaptive algorithms, such as adaptive mesh refinement, uh, that in fact use graphs in order to dramatically reduce the actual number of computations you have to perform while still retaining the same level of accuracy that you would have otherwise done. Uh, the adaptive mesh refinement only does computation at those points on boundaries or where there are highly fluctuating uh, values in the computation, leaving other parts of the computation to use fairly broad, broad um, graphs. For the few of you who have interest in symbolic computing, artificial intelligence, uh, planning, uh, game playing, and so forth, there too, in the area of knowledge management and understanding, uh, these are large, potentially large semantic nets and also large search trees uh, for which are graphs in terms of computing. So graphs, in my expectation, will emerge as an ever larger, uh, a larger domain of computation until, uh, uh, as we use more and more intelligent computing. Uh, and that means uh, high performance computing for symbolic processing. The ideas here come from many different sources. 
Split phase transactions, no, this is not transactional processing in the sense that it's commonly used. It simply allows a disassociation of the physical, I'm sorry, the abstraction of the computation from the physical medium. So that if the abstraction itself is blocked, the physical medium is not. The split phase transaction allows you to partition in time the different operations, doing all of those in a single locale, lo local domain, and then moving on to some other local domain. That addresses uh, the problems of latency because you're not doing a lot of gathers. You're simply moving the work to the data. And this is important because it's not always optimal to move the data to the work. To determine when you want to do a computation, well, in an asynchronous machine, you don't know when all the precedent constraints are going to be satisfied. And like the original data flow models in the 1970s and 80s, you can establish constraint-based synchronization criterias that define under what conditions a future action can occur rather than explicitly determining and establishing and fixing when that action is going to take place. You combine these together and you get yet another old concept, although used in a very new way, and that is data-directed execution. The merging of conventional control parallelism with data parallelism. These are not separate. They are, in fact, two parts of the same larger types of parallelism. And this parallelism is, in fact, embedded in the large metadata of these kind of graph problems, among others, that I've been mentioning. In that case, data-directed execution by merging data parallelism and control parallelism as implemented in the runtime system with help from the compiler and I would hope in the long term help from the uh, architecture uh, allows you to expose and exploit the intrinsic, the inherent parallelism of the metadata of these structures. Da parallelism we are not exploiting currently and that we desperately need if we're going to get to the billion plus way parallelism that we need. And finally, to reduce the overhead and to permit the whole system to be used as a single system rather than as a large ensemble of independently programmed systems, uh, we require a global namespace. Not a new idea, surely, though the form of that namespace is still in debate. Experiments with partition global address space have exposed some of the value, but not with the true flexibility that's needed. A more advanced form, we call it AGAS for active global address space. Uh, is needed, allowing you to move uh, um, virtual objects in physical domain without, as you would have to do in PGAS, changing their name. These concepts and a few others have been merged together in the experimental parallax execution model that has allowed us to develop systems and ultimately applications to demonstrate and to, again, explore this new class of runtime execution uh, for real-world applications. This is a cartoon that gives you a sense of some of what goes on here. The little squiggly black lines are these localized threads of execution, which, which are ephemeral. They run for a certain amount of time and they terminate, as indicated by those red blotches. Before they do, they can change local data. Uh, they can also send those messages, those parcels, to other parts of the system and create new work elsewhere, moving the work to the data, which can take much less effort, much less energy, much less time than, than again, bringing all the data to the work. Although, indeed, a gather is quite possible in this, in this model. Uh, we also have these specialized synchronization constructs, very lightweight, very rich in semantics, quite different from the global barriers we occasionally, or we, we frequently use in the um, uh, bulk synchronous parallel or protocol uh, method that's uh, typical of conventional programs. And these uh, local control objects are able to put, create those constraint-based synchronization points that I'm talking about. They also allow you to actually move the control, the actual control from one part of the system to the other. Well, what, what does that mean? Well. We, we keep the control in one place, right? We have a thread. There's a thread in a processor, it's the program counter, it's a stack pointer, and it stays there. 
Well, <laughs> that's not very good. Not if, in fact, the work you want to do is going to work on all the data over there and you've got it over here. You want to pick this up and you want to move it. Very little information, actually. And you want to move it all the way across the system so the work can be continued to be done locally, saving energy, dramatically mitigating latencies, and reducing overheads. Now, I mentioned constraint-based synchronization a couple of times. Again, this is a kind of declarative semantic. It says, under these conditions, you can do a piece of work. Let me, let me show you a diagram here. So I, out of, um, in honor of uh, uh, Gao, I decided to use an example of semantics for data flow. Here we have uh, three basic areas. Uh, to the left, you see the input incidents. In data flow, values would be arriving. Not until all the values arrived, this is a strict specification, are you able to do an operation. So the values can arrive, and they can arrive out of order. Now the control state associated with this simple object, and yes, I'm talking object-oriented here in this case, a simple object, and the control state maintains a history that indicates the change that occurs in response to the incidence of these input values. It's associated with a predicate that's tested and that one or more different conditions if satisfied can allow a future piece of work to be instantiated. And that piece of work is in the final stage. And in this case, it suggests that a thread could be instantiated in order uh, to do this. Now, here you have actually a single construct in which the classic data flow execution model could be entirely encapsulated. And, and Gao will insist, but I didn't include the data, and I guess he's right. So um, uh, the data structures that uh, could be used. But this is in itself an extremely powerful mechanism, and yet it's only a tool, an element, that allows us to do much more powerful parallel computing. I've also talked about message-driven computation, and, and so here's, here's an example of a, of a parcel, and this is typical although a variant of a number of approaches that use active message, messages. There's a, there's a destination. In the case of the parcels, it's a virtual destination, not a physical destination. And there's a payload that carries data. That would be true with, with any message, uh, certainly. But there's also this notion of an action. The action to be performed on the data that is represented by the destination. And that, that data can be some element or elements in a data structure. It can be an object. It can be an active process or an active thread. It can either change the internal state of the execution of that, or it can change the state of it completely, like defer it, change it, kill it. Oh, and there is that one other piece of uh, information on, in the, the structure of a parcel. And that is, we call it a continuation. And a continuation is a piece of control state. It says, and when you finish this, what do you do afterwards? One possibility is, in fact, that you either uh, touch or instantiate one of those local control objects. So now control is a first-class entity in the execution model itself. These, these parcels, these active messages upon incidents of a physical uh, element in the system can have many different effects. I've suggested that they can already instantiate threads uh, or change the threads themselves. They can do very lightweight actions on uh, memory uh, local at a remote site uh, without actually having to create a thread. They can move data or they can request data to be uh, moved. They can touch and permute the state of local control objects, and they can even touch hardware. They can even go and they can throb a bit in the hardware or, or read it. They're very flexible and they can do many things. So we've done it. Well, you never finish doing anything like this. But Parallax has been represented in a series of experimental runtime systems, most recently HPX3, developed under the direction of Hart McKaiser at Louisiana State University, uh, developed based on uh, C++. That's both good and bad. 
Um, if you program in C++, I know there's no other way. If you don't program in C++, you can't stand the stuff. I write in Python. I won't continue on that course. <laughs> the runtime system has basically four major elements in it. it. will not surprise you. It reflects the underlying model. There is, in fact, a lightweight uh, threaded con uh, instantiation context switching system, a user thread system, not a, not a p-thread system uh, from the Unix operating system. There is an address translation scheme that is global for the um, active global address space system, works both locally and globally. Very important thing that it has to do very efficiently is answer a simple question. Is this identified object local or global, yes or no? And that's one of the things that it does. It handles very efficiently these local control objects, very carefully optimized to make them uh, minimum, uh, minimum uh, overhead. Um, and finally, it handles the parcels. And um, th uh, again, the efficiencies of managing the parcels is very important. And so this system has been deployed on a number of machines uh, within the university, universities, I should say, and also at, uh, experimentally at some of the uh, Department of Energy National Labs. Uh, it's been deployed uh, for the Army at the Corps of Engineers and, and other places as well. So this brings us to the closing comments and back to where we started with that application. I said that in order to detect something, you have to already know what you're looking for. And that means with regards to LIGO, again, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Observatory, that you have to be, uh, you have to simulate the phenomena you think you're going to look for. For example, in 1987, in one of the uh, Magellanic clouds, there was a supernova that was uh, discovered. <clears throat> before LIGO, unfortunately, but it was of sufficient uh, scale that the gravitational wave, we assume, would have been more than sufficient to be detected uh, by this model. I know it's a little unkind of me to point out, but LIGO is about 10 years old, and the number of um, signals that it has uh, detected is relatively small, uh, although it is NSF's most expensive uh, project. Uh, to be exact, that number is um, zero. Nada. Okay, so, um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, sadly, uh, the NSF uh, did what obviously it had to do after 10 years of not getting anything. And uh, so it, uh, it threw a lot more money at it to make it more accurate, more sensitive, so I think they could measure to a greater number of significant, different, dis, significant digits nothing. So we're going to have zero to a much, much higher resolution. OK, that's pessimism. Actually, I expect that uh, uh, there are gravity waves out there, and they will be detected at some point. And I hope the good people at the LIGO experiment get to get to share in that glory, it is certainly going to be one of the most important uh, results of the early uh, 21st century. Now, the simulation needed to detect these colliding neutron stars uh, can be done in the typical conventional fashion. In fact, it has. Uh, using adaptive mesh refinement in order to get this 10 to the fourth advantage in terms of reduction of number of operations that you have to perform, uh, a, a system called HAD, and it doesn't even stand for anything, uh, an AMR system was done for this purpose to show, uh, to, to deal with the uh, colliding neutron stars and, and to simulate what we think the uh, gravitational wave would look like. Or we, we could use parallax and try to expose a parallelism that's not being exposed, and in particular to allow the different parts of the computation that would take very different amounts of time because of the highly irregular structure of the data uh, to operate at their own preferred rate and indeed possibly literally overlapping different phases of computation. I showed you a DAG earlier from Barcelona. Here is a DAG that's used, a simple uniform DAG that's used. You'll see any one of these constraint synchronization points only has a few of a very large array of such, uh, pro, uh, of such action because you don't need a lot. It could be larger than this. The degree could be, say, five, but not much more. 
So here is, uh, here's an example of the simulation. And if I can do this, yes. I live for this moment. What you've just seen here is a cut set through a three-dimensional um, uh, range of space using adaptive mesh refinement with a gravitational pulse injected at the middle, and then you saw the, the ripple effects of the gravity waves through the time-space continuum. This is numerical relativity. I love saying time-space continuum. It's really good. Now, so. It's not often that someone like me who doesn't really write applications gets somebody else not only to have a really great application in MPI, but to be willing to rewrite it from scratch in something as obscure as Parallax's HPX C++ call interface, which, by the way, is changing on every few weeks. So no matter what your application does, it won't work a few weeks later and get them to do it for less than $50,000 a year. I love postdocs. Oh, sorry, did I offend some? The work I'm showing you is done by my colleague, uh, Matt Anderson, who is, is truly a rare computational scientist, a credible uh, cosmologist uh, in the area of numerical relativity and uh, programming. Here, for an example, just to give you a flavor of what we're talking about, are comparisons between the use of had implemented an MPI and had Im implemented using the HPX3 runtime system. The dotted lines are the, those using uh, MPI and the solid lines are using um, uh, parallax. Now the black dots and the black solid line represent no uh, levels of refinement. So this is sort of non-AMR, AMR or something. And you find that, in fact, uh, uh, this is a scaling graph, that the MPI uh, implementation was doing better, that to say the black dotted line is doing better than the black solid line. And then you start adding levels of refinement. And guess what? The MPI scalability, as you add parallelism, goes down. While, as you would expect, the parallelism for the implementation with parallax goes up. But perhaps uh, something a little bit more absolute, the actual comparison of the run times. Here, it's, uh, you're looking at the MPI run time of the HAD execution unit compared to the HPX version of the same application on the same physical system. And depending on the number of cores, and admittedly this is a very small number of cores, but it gives you the idea, you have a performance advantage of a factor of two to almost a factor of four. I'm not talking about 20% to 40%. I'm talking about a factor of two to a factor of four. The only thing we've changed is the application. And we're using the application that actual scientists, I should have a can with a scientist picture on it, right? Smiling, pointing at We Actual scientists have been used to do real science. And we're still just stuck on the same machine. But here's the money shot. Here for me is the diagram that really expresses what's actually happening. When we first did this experiment and we got this data, uh, I can say honestly that I was emotionally impacted. I've never seen this. What do these silly lines mean? Well, the horizontal line is physical time. Your, your watch, if we still use watches, our thing we call a phone, um, that's the physical time that's going by. The vertical is simulation time. Uh, if you draw a line, uh, across horizontally from any point on the vertical axis, you're talking about the same point in simulation time. Therefore, if you draw a vertical line, you're talking about the same point in physical time. So let's do that. Draw a line in your mind from, say, oh, there's a thousand of physical time, thousand seconds in vertical. You'll notice that these different curves, each one representing a different point on the radio of that uh, um, uh, simulation I just showed you, each one of these represents different color, different point on that. And what's happening? At any one point in time, there are different parts in simulation time that are being executed. The system is self-adapting. Not only are we overlapping a phase of computation with communication, we're overlapping multiple phases of computation. In fact, in more complex experiments, we've seen as many as nine different phases of computation overlapping each other. 
seeking the optimality because in any particular phase, the shortest amount of execution in an inner loop and the longest could vary in greater than a factor of 20. This is where the performance advantage comes from. Now, it's mitigated, that's the wrong word, it's limited because we're still running on pure hardware. And so what closely limits us is the overhead. Remember slow, starvation, latency, overhead, and waiting. The overhead limits the granularity of the parallelism we can effectively use, and therefore the amount of flexibility and concurrency that we can exploit. And depending on the specific operating point, both of the application and the system, we have found where the optimal or approximately optimal grain size is in this three-day space. And what you're supposed to take home from this image is that it changes. And so that performance is, efficiency is, highly sensitive to the granularity. And any future system has to take this in consideration at programming time, at compile time, and at runtime. And so these systems are sophisticated and complicated in order to ultimately exploit the hardware that they're given. But we have the evidence that demonstrates that we can do that. So in conclusion, I have tried to bring to your attention that we are in a phase change in the field of high performance computing, that we are about to experience a paradigm shift. Cliche aside, this is consistent with past history of supercomputing and that we should anticipate this, not resist it. That such a, execute, I'm sorry, such a paradigm is really manifest, is represented by a change for us in the computing field as an execution model, a set of semantics of rules that govern the form and function of the means, the strategy by which we do computing, and the systems upon which we run it. I have identified several such phase shifts and discussed a potential experimental one, Parallax, that addresses the same sources of performance degradation in the space of the new technologies that we're now dealing with. I've shown you some, I've, I described the Parallax execution model and uh, talked a little bit about an experimental runtime system that reflects that and shown you some results from a strong scaled problem, a problem that frankly takes weeks, five, six weeks to run, but doesn't scale even up to a thousand cores using conventional techniques with MPI. And so I hope what I've done is suggest to you that there is tremendous opportunity right now to do new research, new exploration, new development, to truly revolutionize computing and enable the possibility of exascale computing before the end of this decade. Thank you all very much. Oh, don't be shy. There was a time when I'd be standing up here, nobody wants to ask me, I'd say, this is awkward. Yeah, I was at a meeting on the West Coast a couple of weeks ago, and somebody asked almost exactly that question. Not to me. I wasn't even invited to speak, uh, but uh, to somebody else. And I was shocked and delighted at the answer. He said, the programmer, he's going to suck it up. <laughs> and the reason is simply this. Uh, I'm talking about the scientist who wants to achieve breakthrough science. We, uh, if that's the person, uh, he or she uh, who doesn't do that will not be able to do the cutting edge science. If I'm right, if I'm wrong, that person shouldn't change what they're doing. Right. 
uh, it's not a very satisfying answer. Uh, what I did not do is talk about the programming models. That's another aspect of the vertical cut set. Uh, and uh, invite me back for another talk, and I'll be glad to talk about that. I will say this uh, to tease, and that is that I'm anticipating that programming exascale machines will be easier than programming petaflops machines. Uh, but they will be different. And uh, many good people are thinking about what is the migration path of legacy codes uh, to such future systems. And that, that too is an issue to be discussed. There are literally billions of dollars of investment in, um, in current codes that are important, not just because of the work, but because of the validation, the verification that's been applied to these. Yeah. Um, so if we forget about computing for a moment, and I would ask you the question about, of an, about astronomers. Should astronomers just look at the sky, or should they build telescopes? Uh, should uh, particle physicists uh, produce the theories, or should they build accelerators? Uh, and there are probably other examples. What we find, I think, through tradition and experience, is that there, for each, each scientist, uh, astronomer or particle physicist, there is a different view on this. And they find that their career is a mix of these different, from one extreme to the other and many in between. I find, perhaps many of you too, when I lay my fingers on the keyboard and I change the parameters and I change the code or the algorithm and I get results, I get positive feedback. I benefit from the experience. I learn. Sometimes I see things that surprise me. And I only understand it because I did it, I, not some other person that I hire. At the same time, these systems are complex. And no one person can build everything. So I think it's a mix of experiences. And I think it uh, depends on the moment, the time, the conditions. And that's really outside the scope of my talk anyway. One more question, and then I'll allow you all to go to reception. Yeah, uh, uh, let, let me paraphrase. I, 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 it's, a, it's, it's an extremely good question. There, there is uh, industry pressure to adapt certain approaches that a number of very large companies, and you could add to that IBM and Intel and Microsoft, if you would like, uh, as well as Amazon and Google and, and so forth. And um, uh, in their view, they all have the answer. Intel has certainly stated it knows how it's going to get to exascale. And it's even made the mistake of saying, and you're going to program the machines the same way you're doing now. Not, not all of Intel, I assure you. But yes, in public, statements like that. Um, the uh, uh, IBM is the classic, uh, don't worry your silly little head about it. We have it under control. Um, ask the people about Blue Waters at Illinois, about IBM having it under control. And. How do we respond to that? You know, um, the, the good news is it really comes down to the final result. Uh, people can claim they have the right answer, including me, but you have not just the right, but the responsibility to demand, ultimately, the proof. The proof is we can do something we can't otherwise do. Now, Amazon, Google have a class of problems which are, frankly, very different, although there are some similarities, to the kinds of problems that I'm talking about. And so when they're worrying about what they're doing with the information on spinning disks and worrying about um, MapReduce, uh, they're really talking about, although there are similarities, they're really talking about different problems. They're talking about different time constants. Time constants that vary by six orders of magnitude. And by the way, orders of magnitude matter. Uh, and so no, one size does not fit all. So 
We have a reception. Again, let me thank you all very much for your attention.